Hello, welcome to PCAP's Native Prairie Speaker Series. My name is Caitlin Rose Seiler, and I'm the Stewardship Coordinator with Saskatchewan Prairie Conservation Action Plan, or PCAP. Today, we have an awesome presentation coming up. Oops, sorry, I hit the wrong button there. Uh, we will be listening to a presentation about habitat occupancy by breeding uh, high bills and horned grebes in Prairie, Canada, correlates of pond use and breeding success. So Dan Routier, Senior Wildlife Biologist from Stantec Consulting is here on the line with us today. But before we begin, I'd like to start by stating we respectfully acknowledge that we are on the traditional territories of many Indigenous nations and communities past and present. For millennia, they have worked to protect these landscapes and the life these areas sustain. I would like to thank these original caretakers and acknowledge the ongoing work and presence of Indigenous peoples in Canada today. I'd like to note that PCAP's Native Prairie Speaker Series is a monthly presentation on anything to do with prairie conservation or species at risk. We have an awesome lineup of presenters coming up this winter. So join us next week, February 2nd, for a presentation about a watershed stewardship approach to invasive species education and management. And on March 2nd, the Alberta Invasive Species uh, Council will be talking about their biocontrol release program. And join us on April 7th for a webinar by Environment and Climate Change Canada about tracking and monitoring turns in Saskatchewan. You can register for all of our webinars on the PCAP website, and past webinars can be found on the PCAP YouTube channel. This webinar will be recorded and uploaded there in the near future. And a reminder to all of our listeners out there, if you have any questions during the presentation, please feel free to type into the questions section of the webinar dashboard at any time during the presentation. If you're on a cell phone, you can send your question by chat to the organizer and questions will be answered at the end of the webinar. I'd like to take a moment to note that financial support for today's webinar is provided by our presenting sponsors, Eco-Friendly SAS and Bridge, Information Services Corporation, Saskatchewan Cattlemen's Association, SASCAL, and Wildlife Habitat Canada. So a bit about today's presenter. Dan Routier is a senior wildlife biologist with Stantec Consulting in Winnipeg, Manitoba, where he works on environmental assessment and resource development projects across Canada, focusing on the technical and regulatory aspects of wildlife work. Dan grew up on a farm in southern Manitoba and obtained an undergraduate degree from the University of Manitoba while working summers and contract positions with the Canadian Wildlife Service on waterfowl and species at risk programs. Dan completed a graduate degree at the University of Saskatchewan where he examined, one, the suitability of existing continental waterfowl surveys for obtaining information on breeding grebes, and two, uh, correlates of pond use and breeding success by horned and pied-billed grebes in the Saskatchewan prairies. After relocating back to Manitoba, Dan worked for Ducks Unlimited Canada on their Boreal Research Program for two years before joining Stantac. Dan has supported wildlife field work throughout Western Canada and now focuses primarily on aiding clients navigate provincial, territorial and federal regulatory requirements, particularly as it relates to migratory birds and species at risk. So with that, I will pass it over. Hi there, everybody. Uh, hopefully you can see this. Um, yes, perfect. Okay. Um, Something wrong there, sorry. Apologies. Okay, um, well, thank you to all those in attendance today and those, and uh, thank you to Caitlin for the great introduction. Um, as she said, my name is Dan Rutze. I'm a wildlife biologist at Stantec Consulting, where I work on a wide range of technical project, wildlife projects across Canada. Um, Sorry, I just want to interrupt. We can see your oh, notes. Sorry. <laughs> you can? Okay. All right. Yeah. No, um, we practice this ahead of time. We figured it out. Let's try that. That should be better, I think. Yes. Perfect. Okay. All right. Sorry, folks. I had my computer do something that uh, 
didn't happen previously. Okay, moving on. Well, uh, today I'll be providing a uh, mainly non-technical overview of a paper that my co-authors and I have recently published that examines how water birds are distributed in the prairie and parkland Canada. Uh, the study took place in South Central Saskatchewan in 2010 and 2011 as part of my graduate work and involves species at risk. So I hope this provides a nice contribution to the native prairie speaker series. I'd first like to thank the many people that have contributed to this work over the years. In particular, my collaborators, Bob Clark, Kevin Dufour, and Mark Bidwell, that worked incredibly hard to ensure this paper got to publication. I'd like to also thank my graduate committee members, Ray Alice Oskis and Christy Morrissey that helped shape this project. And finally, the many people that provided support along the way, including Jim Lee Fleur, Steve Leach, Lauren Bordelotti, Chantal Mickelson, and Colin McKay. Today's presentation largely follows the structure of the paper in that it includes the objectives, methods, and main discussion points within the paper. But I'll start with a brief introduction to the wonderful world of grebes for those not familiar with these birds. And I'll finish with a few bonus slides of the conservation implications of this work and what research needs still exists and what work is currently underway. As the title of the paper indicates, this work focused on pied-billed grebes and horned grebes. Other grebe species that can be found in the prairies are ear grebes, redneck grebes, western grebes, and Clark's grebes that typically do not interact competitively with pied-billed or horned grebes, except for redneck grebes in some areas. Grebes as a whole are an understudied and poorly understood group of birds, partly because of their secretive behavior, but also because they generally occur over broad areas at relatively low densities. In some cases, grebes have been used as indicator species of wetland health, and commonalities between both species include that they're both secretive and territorial birds that breed throughout Saskatchewan, they both overwinter in more southern latitudes and return to Canada in spring, both species migrate at night. They both rely heavily on semi-permanent and permanent wetlands for nesting and brood rearing. And they both construct floating nests in emergent vegetation. And they both compete for finite wetland resources that are subject to a high degree of anthropogenic loss and degradation, as well as natural climatic variation. Billed grebe is a widely distributed and common water bird species in Saskatchewan with a secure global and provincial population. As you can see from the range map on the left, the species occurs throughout most of Saskatchewan and some migrate as far south as southern South America. The species is highly secretive and territorial and has been shown to be the dominant species over horn grebe, often usurping established horn grebe territories in the breeding grounds. Their bill morphology allows them to capture and consume larger prey items, but they're an opportunistic forager and will consume insects, amphibians, crustaceans, and fish where available. The horn grebe is a widely distributed and common water, species, water bird species in Saskatchewan as well, with a secure provincial population that is not faring so well elsewhere in Canada. The highest breeding densities of the species occur on the prairies. You'll see that they're more common than pied-billed grebe in our study area. And as the range map on the left illustrates, they migrate to the southern and coastal United States for over winter. On rare occasions, they nest in small colonies and they consume primarily invertebrates on the breeding grounds. The species was listed on Schedule One of the Federal Species at Risk Act, a special concern in 2017, due to long and short-term population declines. In Saskatchewan, threats to the species include loss and degradation of habitat, drought, and nest predation. The objective of the study was to identify the processes that influence patterns of habitat use by grebes that can then be used to help inform conservation programs. This included objectives to, one, evaluate correlates of pond use and breeding success at different spatial scales. This is illustrated in the diagram where we considered correlates at the landscape, local, and pond scales. Landscape scales being wetland density 
of this individual study sites. Local being surrounding land use type and pond level being pond size and amount of emergent vegetation, for example. And two, evaluate creep competition for resources. Fortunately, the next few slides outline the methods used in the study and hopefully I don't lose anyone to a midday siesta. The study area evolved to accommodate several research questions from my graduate work. And as a result, the foundation of the study area comes from the Waterfowl Breeding Population and Habitat Survey, which is completed annually by the United States Fish and Wildlife Service and the Canadian Wildlife Service to estimate waterfowl populations. The survey consists of an aerial count of waterfowl complemented by ground counts to generate visibility correction factors. In other words, to adjust for imperfect detection of birds and ponds from the air. The survey area is separated into east and west survey areas, shown by the green and yellow colors in the above figure, which is further divided into survey strata, the oddly shaped polygons that make up the survey area. Each strata contains long survey transects that are flown using fixed wing aircraft and two observers counting waterfowl. Horizontal lines show how aerial transects are comparatively concentrated in the prairie pothole region. That's where the highest density of waterfowl occurs. Gen ground, counts, ground counts are completed on a small portion of a subset of aerial transects to develop a correction factor for the population estimates. So essentially detection probability. Ground count segment data were used to identify areas of high and low wetland density in South Central Saskatchewan for our project. The ground count segments are the short horizontal lines in the bottom figure. Seven segments highlighted in red were used as study sites in 2010 and 2011. Our final data set included 172 randomly selected semi-permanent and permanent wetlands. And we not observe any use of seasonal wetlands by grebes. And while the data was collected in 2010 and 2011, my study area figure looks like it's from the early 1990s, so please no GIS questions later on. All right, the survey methods. During the breeding season, we completed three visits from late May to early April. Sorry, <laughs> that shouldn't be early April. Um, it's early, it should be late June, at evenly spaced intervals that were used to determine habitat occupancy probability. That is, the probability a given wetland is occupied by a breeding pair. During the brood rearing season, we returned to the same three wetlands the same wetlands three times from early July to mid-August, which was used to evaluate nest success. The protocol used, or sorry, the four-minute call broadcast survey protocol was developed specifically for detecting horn and pied-billed grebes. The protocol includes passive listening periods along with an active sequence of calls for horn grebe first, followed by pied-billed grebe calls. Evidence suggested that pie bill greaves were dominant over horn greaves, and having the calls ordered this way was hoped to elicit a response from both species versus horn greaves shying away if a pie bill grebe call was played. We collected habitat attribute data at the pond level, such as the amount of emergent vegetation, and at the local level, which included quantifying land cover types around each wetland. For the last slide, this is the last slide on the methods. Uh, the analysis. From our three repeat visits to each wetland, we developed what's called an encounter history, which is a series of ones and zeros indicating whether the species was detected, a one, or not detected, a zero, during each of the three visits. It's used to estimate the probability of both detection and occupancy. Single season occupancy model was used for each species using the three occasion encounter history from the breeding season surveys. Greaves rarely co-occurred on ponds in this study, and therefore the use of a co-occurrence model was not suitable, unfortunately. It's a two-step modeling approach. 
First, detection was modeled as a function of environmental covariates such as temperature, wind speed, and cloud cover, systematic covariates such as time of day and observer, and biophysical co covariates such as pond area, shoreline complexity, and the amount of emergent vege vegetation. And covariates in the best approximating detection model were retained in all candidate models used to then estimate occupancy. We then used biologically relevant a priori variables to develop a final candidate set of to model occupancy. The unmarked package in R and Akaiki's information criterion based approach for model selection and model averaging were used. All right, if you're still awake, I made it to the fun part, the results. Uh, hopefully this table doesn't scare anybody, but I won't go into it in any great detail. The important part is that overall, Pied Bill Grebe had a detection probability of 33% and an occupancy probability of 15%. In other words, of the 172 ponds in our study, 15% had breeding, gre breeding Pied Bill Grebes, and we detected them in one in every three of the visits. Horn grebe, we had a greater ability to detect the species at 79% detection probability, and there were more of them with 28% occupancy probability. The best approximating model for detection probability for pie bill grebe included wetland area and date, while wetland area and time of day had the greatest influence for horn grebe detection probability. There was some model selection uncertainty, but key covariates for pie bill grebe occupancy probability were wetland area, shoreline complexity, and the amount of cropland surrounding the pond. For horn grebe, the amount of emergent vegetation within the pond was the key covariate. We'll look at a visual representation of these results in a second. But first, the principal finding is that these grebe Grebe habitat use in our study was most closely related to pond specific factors rather than those operating at spatial scales beyond the local wetland basin, consistent with previous water bird research. However, there was some support suggesting surrounding land use influenced by built grebe habitat occupancy. There was no support to suggest grebe occupancy was influenced by wetland density. A pond in a low or high density wetland landscape was equally as likely to contain a breeding grebe. However, the total number of wetlands in those two landscapes are obviously quite different. Here, we're looking at the model averaged occupancy probability predictions for the key covariates mentioned a couple slides ago. In figure A, you can see that horn grebe, represented by the solid black line, preferred open wetlands with less emergent vegetation. In B through D, pied billed grebe, represented by the solid gray line, was most likely to occupy wetlands with increased shoreline complexity, wetland area, and lower amounts of surrounding cropland. Those var covariates did not appear to influence horn green, horned grebe occupancy. You'll notice how low precision, there is low precision for some covariates, as indicated by the wide 95% confidence intervals represented by the dashed lines, which is an artifact of the small sample size, such as very large ponds or those with 80 to 100% emergent vegetation in our study. Finally, we did not find support for nonlinear relationships. When it comes to competition and co-occurrence, the study area consists primarily of smaller ponds that do not provide enough space or resources for multiple competing pairs. Pied build and horned greaves rarely co-occurred on the same ponds, and it's likely that territories encompassed entire wetlands. Of the three instances of co-occurrence of breeding adults, only one pond contained a brood of each species. The two other instances of breeding co-occurrence suggested pie-billed grebes usurp previously established territories from horn grebes. Two additional instances of brood co-occurrence were observed, likely as a result of pond amalgamation as ponds flooded together late in the year. <laughs> 
We considered nest success as being one or more chicks observed on one of the three surveys during the brood rearing season. We observed similar rates of nest success with 67% nest success for pod build grebes and 75% for horn grebes. Because we had greater occupancy rates for breeding horn grebes, this subsequently translated into a greater number of broods, 38 horn grebe broods compared to just 16 for pied billed grebes. So what does it all mean? In general results were consistent with previous waterbird research on the prairies. Our key findings include Habitat occupancy was most closely related to pond-specific covariates rather than those operating at spatial scales beyond the local wetland basin. <clears throat> Nest success was similar between species and it remains unknown if pied-billed grebes could force horn grebes into suboptimal breeding habitats. There are obviously areas of southern Saskatchewan that are great for horn grebe production. Differential habitat preferences may serve to limit interspecific competition. For example, horn grebes prefer more open wetlands that are avoided by pied billed grebes. And finally, the study was completed in 2010 and 2011, which was the start of a long wet period in Saskatchewan. And it's difficult to predict how this has influenced, had influenced the distribution, competition, and nest success of breeding grebes. I remember in early May 2010, it was extremely dry and somebody asked me what I was going to do if conditions didn't improve. I had no idea and it was a concern as grebes need water after all, but within days it started to rain and it didn't stop. And by late June, ponds were brimming, which obviously provided a lot of water for grebes well into 2011 and beyond. I think we're all here for one reason or not or another because we care about prairie conservation and the stressors placed on that wonderful landscape. I just wanted to highlight a few of the conservation implications and considerations of this work. Stressors on wildlife and wildlife habitat include things like land use practices, habitat conservation, habitat conversion, and climate change, which is nothing new. But while there is an observable difference in pond occupancy rates between low and high wetland density landscapes, the latter contributes disproportionately more breeding habitat for grebes. Conservation initiatives that protect habitat for grebes, particularly for horn grebes, should focus on prairie and parkland regions that contain a high density of semi-permanent and permanent wetlands. Landscapes composed of high densities of wetland basins and breeding ducks are currently being targeted for wetland and upland habitat protection and restoration in the prairie pothole region under the North American Waterfall Management Plan. And our findings indicate that grebe species could benefit from these initiatives. There's a trend in transitioning towards multi-species and ecosystem-based conservation that can promote the management and recovery of species at risk, while also enhancing ecosystem services and habitat opportunities for a wide range of plant and wildlife species, which would include breeding grebes. Now, before I wrap this up, I have two slides on ongoing and future work. Some of the things we identified as being potential drivers of the distribution of grebes that we didn't account for, but that are interesting research questions include how water levels affect the distribution, competition, and nest success of grebes, and what happens during drought conditions, or average water conditions in our case. Are there negative effects from agricultural activities, particularly as it relates to water quality in macroinvertebrate communities? How is competition related to forage availability in ponds? all these species can consume different prey items? And how is a range expansion of redneck grebe affecting pie-billed grebe and horn grebe? Ultimately, surveys conducted during the wet-dry cycle that incorporate behavioral observations of marked grebes and detailed productivity metrics would be ideal. Fortunately, grebes are getting more attention and a group of researchers at Environment and Climate Change Canada and the University of Saskatchewan is one example of some fascinating work being undertaken with grebes in Prairie Canada. 
Kirsty, Kevin, Christina, Eric, and Cindy are examining migratory connectivity and contaminants in grebes and whether differences in wintering regions affect concentrations of contaminants measured in breeding areas. This is a big picture study from multiple populations across Manitoba, Saskatchewan, British Columbia, and Northwest Territories using light level geolocators, stable isotopes, and egg and blood samples. I, like many, are interested in seeing the results of this very interesting work, and a big thank you to Kevin and Kirsty for sharing some photos on this page from their work in 2021. And with that, I'll thank you again for attending and giving me the opportunity to present in this fantastic speaker series, and I hope you found this to be a worthwhile way to spend your Thursday lunch hour albeit a little bit less than an hour for sure. And last but not least, a big thank you to Caitlin for being so helpful in assisting me to get this presentation to all of you. And I'd be happy to answer any questions you might have. First of all, thank you so much for the great presentation. It was really informative. Um, and to all of our listeners out there, if you have any questions, just type it into the question section of the webinar dashboard. Um, Dan, we do have a couple questions, if that's all right, um, and feel free to uh, to keep the slide if you want to go back and forth to, to other slides if you'd like. Sure. Um, so the first question um, says, apologies if I missed this during the presentation, but what was the spatial scale that the covariate representing cropland surrounding the breeding wetlands measured at, and how was it measured, the distance from the wetlands? Were there different spatial scales explored? We, we just used a 100 meter buffer of each individual wetland to represent that covariate. Um, we didn't explore multiple um, spatial scales. It's obviously would be an interesting question. Um, and it was completed just by taking a, uh, a, it wasn't a spatial analysis of any GIS based, it was just observers. Um, evaluating approximately within 100 meters of the wetland what the composition of the upland uh, east was. Excellent. Thanks for that answer. Um, the next question is about nest success. You mentioned that um, like two-thirds or three-quarters of the nests were successful. Do you know why they were not successful? Uh, unfortunately, we don't have, I guess, that fine resolution of information. Uh, I, I can take a, a guess at what I think some of it is. I, I know, I, I guess from what I've, I've observed, um, in 2010, there were a number of nests lost due to rising water levels. Like I said, the, the water um, started in mid-May to late May in some areas, and it just kept going and going and going up until, you know, August even. And so some of those nests were flooded. Some were, um, depredated um, and those are the, the the ones that I know of um, there's there's likely a whole host of other reasons but definitely the weather and the rain played a whole whole uh, part in that for sure and do you know if grebes will nest again will they will they build another nest if the first one's not successful I don't know if there's any confirmed records of double brooding by grebes. We didn't see that in any of our studies. I, I, I mean, we weren't you know, explicitly looking for that, but I think that's something that we would have encountered. Um, I mean, most, it's difficult to say if, if a pair lost their nest, they're likely to move wetlands. Um, or if they lost their nest and we came back 10 days later and they built another nest, it would be difficult for us to know that. I mean, we weren't marking individual nests, so um, it's uncertain. But in terms of double brooding, they definitely wouldn't do that, I don't think. I mean, they're, they, they struggle to get those chicks to size for fall migration as it is, so. Yeah, just there wouldn't be enough time then. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, the next question is from a listener named Daniel. Um, do you think that strategically located trail cameras placed on T-posts along the wetland emergent edges would increase your chances of detecting uh, of these both secretive grebes? 
I've never thought about that. I, I mean, it, it's certainly one way that you could do it. I don't necessarily think it's the most effective way. I think we've shown that with even a even a four minute call broadcast survey, these species are actually extremely responsive to um, the call of of horn grebe or pied billed grebe. So uh, for example, if you if you play a horn grebe call, the horn grebes will immediately come in. Um, and so will pied billed grebes and uh, if you play the pied bill grebe call, a pied bill will come right in as well. Um, so I, th I think those that's definitely the most effective way to do it. Um, it'd be difficult and time consuming, I think, to use remote cameras to accomplish that. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, with the calls, is it kind of like a hunting call or did you play it on kind of a speaker? <laughs> How did it work? <laughs> yeah, you can, you can, um, well, it's funny, they're, they're kind of uh, little speakers that you would use for uh, hunting or they're electronic callers um, that we just load our survey protocol into the, the horn grebe call and the pie build grebe call and there's intermittent pauses in the call. Um, so there's passive, sur passive survey to start where you just observe quietly and then the horn grebe call comes on and it's played through this loudspeaker. Yep. Okay, cool. Um, a listener named Nicole is wondering, um, did you observe what surrounding habitat pie-billed grebes preserve? For example, willow rings over emergent vegetation? Sorry, could you repeat that? I'll just turn off my webcam. Um, <laughs> my bandwidth is a little slow today. Uh, did you observe what surrounding habitat pie-billed grebes preferred? Uh, for example, willow rings over emergent vegetation? Um, I don't know that I would have that empirically, but just from, from the wetlands in our study area, predominantly uh, not so much in willow ringed or tree ringed wetlands. Often you would find them in, uh, in wetlands with heavy cattail and, and interspersed cattail for the most mm -hmm. part. That makes sense. And a listener named Brad says, I've observed two pairs of nesting horned grebes each year near my home. I'm surprised at how soon the adults leave the pond and seemingly abandon their young. Is this typical behavior? Um, well, I, I guess I don't know what he's referring to as how soon. Um, they're actually quite good parents, I would say, in that they... Uh, you know, they're often, the young are often riding on the parents' back as they cruise around wetlands looking for, for food while they're younger. Um, and then I guess once those, those broods get to an age where they can feed by themselves, because when they're young, the parents will bring them food items and prey items. And so once they're able to capture those items, um, yeah, I, I mean, those, those young would likely remain flightless uh, while their parents took off to other larger water bodies to molt prior to migration. Thanks for that answer. What are your thoughts about how climate change will impact grebes? The great question, I guess. It's obviously very difficult to predict, but I think it goes without saying that we're looking at uh, two big issues. One is is the lack of water on the prairies and that will ultimately be a direct loss of habitat for grebes um, and for horn grebes if that puts them into competing for those resources with pied built grebes and redneck grebes in some areas then that could be detrimental to their population but the other thing is the the increased instances of severe weather events so uh, you know, as you saw in some of the photos, they have a very precarious nest, uh, especially early on in the year. They build it in emergent vegetation. In a lot of cases, that vegetation hasn't come up yet. Right? That of those cattails or whatever, they, they haven't grown in some cases, um, unless they're nesting in old areas. But because in our study, we had a lot of water, they were they weren't able to access some of those areas in some cases. And so if you have a weather event, especially early on in the year, or you have years where 
those water levels rise rapidly or you have a lot of wind action that can really hamper nest success. Yeah, it's unfortunate. Um, what is your favorite grebe? Um, I'd say pied billed grebes are just, they have so much personality in the way that they respond to a, uh, a the, the survey protocol. They kind of little submarines that will just poke their head up and and uh, it's almost in a in a playful way. But trust me, they're not playing. They're they're very aggressive about it, but they're pretty neat. Cool, that's awesome. Um, our next question: In terms of wetland area, were there any thresholds in size identified where wetlands smaller than the threshold were generally not occupied by pied billed grebes or horned grebes? um didn't i would say no i think we had i would have to look at that a little bit more closely but we did have some of our smallest semi-permanent wetlands occupied by grebes now i again i'd have to look at it but the threshold would be larger for pied billed grebes they you would typically find them on larger wetlands where you could find breeding horn grebe in know a dugout with almost zero emergent vegetation or in some of these wet years you know really small ponds with very little emergent vegetation and so uh, I don't know if there's an exact threshold I think it's a matter of what resources are there for the birds that makes sense um Daniel is uh, our listener named Daniel is wondering: Are red-necked grebes, grebes known to be more territorial and aggressive than pie-billed or horned grebes? Do you know anything about that? Well, I wouldn't say that they're necessarily more aggressive. I would say that they're probably equally as aggressive, but they're quite a bit larger. Um, now they feed on prey items like fish. So there is some separation there where you wouldn't expect interaction between, let's say, horn grebe and redneck grebe, but their range is expanding. So, you know, there was a study in southern Manitoba, south of Minnedosa, where they looked at that. And, you know, in years past where they didn't have any redneck grebes, now all of a sudden they're kind of everywhere. And so um, there are areas in Saskatchewan where I suspect that that's the same thing. Um, so they are highly competitive like the other grieve species because again they are competing for the same resources in some cases so it could it could be detrimental for horn and pied billed grebes maybe less so for pied billed grebes i imagine they would be able to punch above their weight to an extent but <laughs> Great, thanks for that answer. Um, a listener named Kevin uh, says, listing on the Species at Risk Act uses mostly breeding bird survey data, but also CBC. What recommendations do you have that can help with understanding um, of horn-billed grebes and pie-billed grebes and other secretive species better? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's a problem for a lot of species, specifically wetland species, and not captured well mm -hmm. under those large-scale systematic um, survey programs. Um, part of my graduate research, we looked at um, the waterfowl breeding and habitat population survey um, and how um, effective ground crews were at identifying breeding grebes in the breeding grounds and, and uh, kind of what some of that past data looked like and whether or not that could be a suitable large scale. Um, program for providing another indus for how water bird populations are doing specifically grebes obviously so i think i think there's some some value in looking at some of those other programs like that survey specifically um, you know you you'd have to have ground crews uh, looking for those species as well as well which is difficult right because <laughs> They often walk up to a wetland and everything scatters and they're looking up and grebes are sinking and swimming away and things like that. So it, it, it has its challenges and I'm not sure if there's a, you know, a, a, a large scale systematic survey like that. Obviously we, we do have some uh, water bird programs um, that, that 
that provide us with really good information for marsh birds. They're, you know, they're trying to capture information on marsh birds, but for places like the prairie pothole region, it's very difficult because there's the wetlands are so small and there's so many of them. And those programs don't necessarily capture birds in those those habitats, unfortunately. So yeah. I don't have the I don't have the answer, unfortunately, but it'd be nice if we had something. Yeah, that for sure. Um, I think that's all the questions that we have. Um, it's nice we had time to answer lots. <laughs> um, oh, there's um, somebody wondering too, uh, to, uh, they say, thank, thanks for the presentation, great talk. Is it possible to go back to the slide with the paper citation? Yes, yes. So this, I believe this is the one they're after, the Environment and Climate Change Canada 2018 the Pan-Canadian Approach to Transforming Species at Risk Conservation in Canada. Yeah, I think so. Um, and I should let our listeners know that if you are not, uh, not in full screen mode, if you have it minimized slightly, there's actually a way to take a screenshot so you can save that whole uh, slide right to your desktop. I know I did that when you were mentioning the, um, is the migratory study that Environment and Climate Change Canada is doing. Um, yeah, I didn't know about that. It's very interesting. Maybe we'll have them do a presentation in the future. <laughs> there you go. It would be great. Yeah, but I think that's um, that's everything for today. So thank you again so much for the awesome presentation. Um, we have lots of people writing in saying thank you. It was a great talk. Great. Um, somebody named Nicole, and I don't know how to pronounce the last name, to cheer from the CWS Migratory Waterfowl Survey. Maybe it's a name you recognize. <laughs> um, so yeah, so thank you again. Lots of people are typing in. So I just want to reiterate all of their uh, gratitude. To our listeners, thank you for joining us. Our next Native Prairie Speaker Series is next week. I can't believe it's February already. So join us to learn about invasive species and wetlands by both the Swift Current Creek and the um, Moose Jaw Watershed Stewards. Um, this presentation has been recorded and will upload it on YouTube in the near future. So with that, uh, thank you so much, everyone, and have a great rest of your day. Thanks, everybody.